In part one of this program, we explored the reasons we have mass and school shootings in the United States. We looked at some of the myths around school shooter profiles and shooter profiles and the misunderstandings around mental illness. For part two, allow me to reintroduce our three guests who will explore solutions to mass and school shootings. The author of Warning Signs, Identifying School Shooters Before They Strike, we have psychologist Dr. Peter Langman. Next, now retired from the FBI's active shooter program and former prosecutor, author of Stop the Killing, How to End Mass Shooting Crisis, we welcome Catherine Schweit. And finally, we welcome Mother Jones Magazine's National Affairs Editor, Plus, he's the author of Trigger Points, Inside the Mission to Stop Mass Shootings in America, Mr. Mark Fullman. Peter, let's start with understanding school shootings in the United States. Is there a way to summarize what's going on? Well, we have a lot of students who are struggling in multiple ways, and they may be depressed and suicidal. They may be angry. They may be targeting specific people at the school whom they feel they have suffered an injustice from. It could be peers, it could be teachers or administrators, or in some cases, there's no one in particular they're targeting at the school. They're just lashing out in general at the world because they're full of rage and this is the best thing they can think to do with their lives. So there's different types of attacks for different reasons. We have to be careful about thinking we can talk about school shooters and school shootings as if they're all the same, because there's significant variations in, the, in this issue. Now, Mark, since the uh, Aurora shooting in the theater, um, been collecting data through Mother Jones, can you see some overall um, nature of what these, this data is revealing regarding mass shootings? Regardless of criteria, we can say we know now that this is a problem that has escalated over the past decade plus, that there are more of these types of attacks and that there are several factors feeding into that. Um, from my perspective, the issue of, of emulation behavior, media and digital media, uh, the increase in firearms in the United States. We have roughly 400 million of them now, uh, easy to access in many places. Uh, there's some bigger cultural and political questions as to why this type of violence has increased, but we do know that it has gone up. Kate, what did you learn about mass shootings as your director of the FBI active shooter program in those five years? What did you learn? I think first we learned that there's a there's a dramatic increase that we didn't anticipate and that we needed to learn uh, as we needed to uh, teach uh, law enforcement how to get to the shooter. First and foremost, that was their job. We spent a lot of money and time. Uh, our tactical instructors, uh, agents, spent a lot of time instructing, uh, particularly local law enforcement, in 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 with that. Um, but we also learned, with regard to the shooters themselves, that um, they didn't fit into a profile. That was helpful for us. We learned that. Um, the individuals who were most likely to see somebody who was on a trajectory towards violence, um, and and you know what I mean by that is that. Uh, people do have, as Mark said, kind of a real or perceived grievance, and then they act on that. So they, these are not, these are not, in, you know, impromptu violent acts. These are planned, targeted violence. And we found that those individuals fit in all categories. Our research showed 12-year-olds to 88-year-olds who committed this type of violence, and they in, in committed it in, you know, half of the were places of business, a uh, quarter of them were in places in, were in schools but that also neighborhoods. Uh, so we found that the shooters were um, it, it only predictive value was uh, that they were male, but they came from all walks of life with these real or perceived grievances. And then they planned and committed this targeted violence. Peter, we keep hearing the term a threat assessment. Could you dive into what this is exactly? Sure. Threat assessment is a process to determine if safety concerns are a false alarm or a real threat of danger. And that involves looking into whatever information is made available. If it's at a school, then school folks would take the information provided to them, interview people, talk to students, talk to teachers, uh, look into the situation, gather as much information as they can to decide if this is a hoax, where someone may be just angry and said something that he didn't really mean, or is this really someone 
who is telling his peers he's going to commit a mass attack. And a critical thing to understand is the point of threat assessment isn't to identify and punish a student by suspension, expulsion, or filing criminal charges against them. The idea is to keep everybody safe, to identify a student who may be struggling in multiple ways and provide the supports to get that student uh, off the path of violence, if that's the path that they're currently on, so that they can be safe and productive members of the school community. Now, Mark, Kate, and Peter, all three of you have talked about the school shootings or the mass shootings that have been thwarted. Mark, is there data on how these shootings have been stopped uh, before they actually even happen? For trigger points, I was able to spend a lot of time with threat assessment teams working on these cases, and in, in many cases to, to great success. The public never knows about these because there was no violent outcome, and that's a good thing. Um, but by going inside the cases and, and watching them develop over many months, I was able to see how threat assessment teams were able to manage individuals who appeared to be turning dangerous, to be developing violent plans of this nature to be planning a mass shooting or a school shooting. Uh, specifically, uh, I spent a lot of time with a, a team in Salem, Oregon, in the Salem-Kaiser School District. They were one of the first to develop a model like this in a public school system after Columbine in 1999. And they have a lot of great institutional knowledge and case history there that they build on. Um, and I write in the book about several cases that I watched through 2019 and 2020, where uh, very troubled, High school students in these cases were beginning to communicate violent ideas and making comments that were perceived as threats to shoot up the school, um, had lots of other kinds of difficulties and, and personal issues going on, signs of personal deterioration, of suicidality. And so what the team did was gather information about the, the individual's case and then try to help them constructively, giving them support in an individual education plan, giving them counseling resources, trying to get them involved in extracurricular activities that appealed to their interests, uh, using what the that threat assessment program calls a wraparound strategy, which is essentially this kind of multifaceted close personal support through the folks in the school system who do that already in their jobs, school counselors, teachers, administrators. And watching this process play out over many months, I was able to see some really remarkable results of, of success in managing uh, students who were raising a great deal of concern, but then eventually began to do better and were steered onto a better path. Um, there's no simple solution to this. It's It can be resource intensive and it can take a lot of time. Um, you can't just hand someone off to a therapist and say, fix this person. The threat doesn't go away like that. Okay, well, for all of you, where are these resources coming from beyond your books and beyond the speeches that you're giving at certain safety conferences or school events? What uh, is there a clearinghouse for these resources or is it more of the Wild West and it's we're doing the best we can? Kate? Well, with regard to threat assessment, I think threat assessment is a, is a long, a long ter established term. And the threat assessment really is a look at in time. So uh, so it's not a, there are plenty of resources available. If you want to set up a threat assessment team, you can see that through the educational uh, systems. You can set up a threat assessment team and then the threat management is over time and in businesses, they set up threat assessment teams in the same way. It's the con the concept behind a threat assessment team is not complicated. It is find the people who can affect change for an individual who may be under stress in a business that might be an HR person and it might be a boss. Um, but sometimes in businesses, the answer has always been, well, I'm just going to fire this guy. But what we know now from the FBI's research is that you fire the guy who comes back with a gun. So it's better to manage it. As Mark said, the threat doesn't go away. Um, and so what we're looking for are the solutions that um, aren't, aren't complex. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that you have to have some big, huge plan to set up a, re a threat assessment team. There are a lot of available resources online, both through academics and through government organizations. Okay. So Peter, after Columbine, and then the shock of Sandy Hook, and most recently, Uvalde, uh, we often see situations get more attention when there are problems. 
it, are you seeing the system getting better with regards to schools and the school system for threat assessment? Yes, I think there's a general trend towards increasing awareness of school safety, and that includes threat assessment. I think initially after Columbine, for whatever reason, we as a country focused more on being reactive, such as implementing lockdown procedures and how to survive an active shooter attack. And those uh, procedures are helpful and could save lives, but those are what you do after there's a gunman in the building. Those are reactive, not proactive. Over time, there's been a greater awareness of the effectiveness and the importance of instituting threat assessment systems in our schools. Now, several states do mandate that every school has to have a threat assessment team. It's still a small number of states, but that to me indicates the growing recognition that we need threat assessment and that threat assessment is effective in keeping our schools safe. I think I would take it a little bit further than what Peter said in terms of the shift in emphasis. I do think that the trend has been in that direction, but not enough in my view that there's still a very heavy emphasis in America on reacting to these events, on target hardening, physical security, fortifying buildings, doing active shooter drills. All of these measures may have some value, but clearly they're not stopping the problem. The problem has been increasing. And I think we still underemphasize prevention work of, of this kind of, of threat assessment and related uh, type approaches to dealing with people who are raising concern before a shooter is in the building. Right now, what we're seeing is a very slow roll to prevention. I have the same thing, like you said, Mark, I have three chapters in my book that have to do with threat assessment and threat prevention. It is a huge help and a huge solution, a way that people can actually participate and get answers and take and help somebody, like you said, wrap around that person and take a person who might be volatile and might be vulnerable at a particular time in their life, whether it's an adult or a high school student, and, and, and give them the support they need. And we're willing to do that for somebody who we think is our, you know, our brother who might commit suicide, but we're not willing to do that for our neighbor or the 16 year old that our kid goes to school with. And that's just wrong. We need to be more aggressive about threat assessment teams. We're not going to, or we're not in threat assessment in general, or we're not going to, we're not going to win this battle. If you look at Uvalde, Look at the perpetrator in that case. We now know already from the Texas state investigation, the fact-finding interim report, that this was an individual who had a very long history of disturbing dark behavior. That you know he got to a point way down a road, a dark road to, that led to this violence. And I think that says speaks very loudly about what might have been possible prior to that point. Whereas so much of the focus has been on was the door locked or unlocked? How many police officers were there? This was a disastrous tactical response by any measure. But part of me feels like we should be talking more about how this never should have happened at all when you look at the case history of the perpetrator. Peter, is that your frustration as well? Absolutely. You know, when I study these attacks, one of the most uh, distressing things about them is how long a time they were brewing, how many people saw a piece of the puzzle and did not report it, how long these students were struggling with all kinds of issues that, as Mark was saying, could have been addressed early on. So we wouldn't have to be having discussions about tactical responses. They could have gotten the supports they needed months or years before their attacks. You know, one thing that I read uh, recently in research, um, I can't cite the specifics to it, is that in cases where uh, a, a reporting is made by an individual, in some something like 85% of the times, that particular piece of information, that person reporting it is the only person reporting it. So when you say to yourself, somebody else will report it, I'll wait and see if somebody else reports it, our research is beginning to show that no, the pieces of the puzzle that Peter was just talking about, you may have the only piece that, that we need in the puzzle. You may be the only one who has access to that information. So really people could be holding back, but need to be much more proactive than uh, defaulting to not getting messed up and mixed up in something, right? Look at the San Antonio shooting that, that was just averted. A woman in an office who heard threatening communications from somebody who she worked with. But when the communications went back to the police on Monday, 
I would have rather she called on Friday, but she called. Uh, when she was there on Friday and heard this and she'd heard disturbing things before, she mentions it on Friday at work. Then they reach out to the subject's house and it turns out that the subject has a has a gun and has a list and 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 the dad says yeah he's he you know he's 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 frustrated he's had these issues these problems now you put all those pieces together and law enforcement actually can do something law enforcement can't do something you know based on somebody who posts a picture online i i think we also need to acknowledge that the obstacles to this kind of reporting are significant and that it's incumbent on leaders of of this field and in this work and, and anyone who's focused on prevention to work on that uh, through greater community education and, and raising awareness and also building trust. Um, you're asking a lot of people to ask them to report to law enforcement um, for reasons that we discussed in, in the previous program. Uh, people may fear what that means for them or the people they're talking to or, or the, who they have relationships with. They may not know where to turn or they may not trust that the process is going to be fair and and uh, quality in nature. And so these are all challenges from my perspective uh, to the, the growth and scaling of uh, community-based prevention through threat assessment work. But if those challenges can be met, there's great potential for more reporting and then action taken with that information to do good prevention work. If I could just jump in, in my book, Warning Signs, I have a whole chapter called Barriers to Action. What gets in the way of people reporting what they know? And as has already been discussed, that could be fear of consequences, simply not wanting to get involved, not wanting to be a snitch. But also, it goes back to the issue of people think they know what a school shooter looks like. My friend doesn't look like what they say they look like. He must be OK. And post attack, so many students have said, sure, I heard him say that. I didn't think he meant it. So there's the barrier of just simply not being able to accept that someone I know could be a mass killer. He seems like a nice person. He's polite. He doesn't fit the so-called profile. We need to educate people to help them get past all these barriers that keep them from coming forward. And so that tells you something, I think, about how important public perception is when we get down to the issue, the crucial issue of reporting, of see something, say something. People need to have a better understanding, I think, of the real nature of this problem. You know, something that's been instructional for me is that, um, you know, after I wrote the book, I was approached by somebody who is from New Zealand, but she's based in London to do a podcast. And we do this podcast podcast called Stop the Killing. And she's really kind of our target market on see something, say something. So we go over cases and we talk about situation shootings, mostly in the United States, but across the world. And I always ask her, would you have reported that fact? And she said, I wouldn't have even thought, thought that that was an unusual circumstance. It's been helpful for me to see how subtle some of these things are and how we have to kind of change our mind about what we might be inclined to just report about because we might be concerned that our neighbor is, is, you know, is, is headed in a bad direction or, or our kid is headed in a bad direction. Because, you know, she is constantly saying, I, I would have reported this, but I wouldn't have reported that. And we hear the same thing from our from our listeners. Um, and also the people who are, um, you know, the people who are reporting so oftentimes they just don't want to get involved. But you are involved. These are happening all over your neighborhoods. School shootings, business shootings are happening all over. There, it, this isn't an urban problem. This isn't a way rural problem. This is a suburban problem in great part where there are people around in big, large groups. So it's really important to report and to report promptly and let the chips fall where they may, understanding that you could be saving the life of your own child. And we've had parents turn their kids in and I think save their lives because of it. Kate, is there overlap with the limitations law enforcement has and uh, how to over overcome these challenges? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the most striking data points that I saw is that when the FBI did research on uh, our behavioral people did research on our shootings uh, that we identified in our initial study, they found that 70% or more, 70, 80, 90% or more, there were peers, 
the people who could see and who saw the distressing behaviors and, and didn't report it or could have reported it, but didn't were peers, family members, um, and, uh, coworkers, but law enforcement, uh, had saw the signs 25% of the time. So law enforcement is never going to be the one to see this compared to how peers, family members, and coworkers see it. They, they're the ones who are seeing the information. They're just not saying something about it. I, I think by the same token, the public needs to understand also that the model of prevention, the method of threat assessment and threat management relies on other types of leaders. It's not just law enforcement. It's also educators. It's mental health professionals. Yeah. It's workplace HR directors. That it's re- leaders of religious institutions. And so this isn't just about law enforcement. I think that's a misconception about threat assessment too, that is a headwind for this field as well, because people associate that with prosecution, not prevention. Uh, Peter, the, the media seems to hold back the identity. I've just noticed this with the Evaldi shooting. We don't know anything about that shooter. Uh, is this something the media has decided to do, or how is this coming about? What's what's your assessment? You know, it often takes months or years for accurate kind of inside information to come out about a perpetrator. So in the immediate aftermath of an attack, there's often very incomplete or very inaccurate information. So, for example, at Columbine, it was seven years before the uh, sheriff's office released 22,000 pages of documents. And with Sandy Hook, documents have been coming out over a period of years. Um, So with Uvadi, you know, we don't know when we're going to get a lot of information, but that makes it difficult to form any kind of detailed understanding of the perpetrator until that information is available. Kate, you mentioned that close to half of these mass shootings are happening at the workplace. So what kind of systems are in place or should be in place? Businesses, first of all, should be uh, giving their HR components better training in how to de-escalate and how to predict people who are, are in distress and coordinate very well with their EAP. I think that the other thing that from a business standpoint, you know, I, I run my own business, right? I've worked in businesses before. It's a money thing. You may say that security is a cost center, but uh, security is is the cost of these kinds of shootings is is look it up on OSHA on workplace violence and the cost of shooting for workplace violence. It costs tens, sometimes tens of millions of dollars, businesses that have had to shut down because of shootings that have occurred or businesses that that are get settled out. I think the, the lawsuit for the Live Nation shooting in Las Vegas, Mandalay Bay uh, settled out for over their policy limit um, in hundreds of millions of dollars. It's a very expensive endeavor for businesses. So they should have their HR people Pay the money to have your HR people properly trained in threat assessment and threat management. Pay the money to have your security people properly trained in threat assessment and threat management. And then institute those. And don't be short-sighted about firing somebody because when you decide to fire somebody and you don't give them a rope, to, to, then you don't give them a rope to hang on to as they're falling. Your two weeks of extra pay or a month of extra severance pay can go a long ways from preventing somebody from coming back to your office with a gun in their hand. So we're reaching the end of this program. Uh, I'd like a comment from each of you in terms of the focus that our viewers could actually pay attention to when it comes to mass or school shootings. Peter? You know, for me, it comes down to what I have as sort of the motto in my book, Warning Signs. We're all on duty. We all have a part to play in looking out for each other and keeping our communities safe. So, you know, be a voice for safety. If you see a safety concern, report it. Don't hold back. Don't wait till you have more information. Hesitation puts lives at risk. So it's a simple message. If you see something, say something. Mark? I think for me in in writing the stories of successful prevention cases where where mass shootings were averted in in trigger points, I I really came to see that there's a lot we can do to kind of demystify this problem, that that school shootings and mass shootings are not these indescribably evil, 
uh, senseless attacks is the way they tend to be described in our in our political debate and media narratives, that we can understand this a lot better through the behaviors and circumstances of these cases by studying the data and through what the field of threat assessment has learned over decades now about prevention of this type of violence. The better, the more that we can do to understand this, the better our chances are for stopping it. And Kate, you mentioned in the part one of this program to lock up your guns, be responsible gun owner. What else would you add? You know, I when I uh, when I put my book together, uh, stop the killing. Ten, I noticed ten of fourteen chapters were on prevention. There are so many things that we can do from a prevention standpoint, but it does really kind of take you believing that you are part of the solution, and that's the, probably the most frustrating thing for me is that. Um, not only should you see something and say something like Peter said, but you, you need to understand that this can happen, will happen in your neighborhood and violence is violence. You don't condone violence in your neighborhood. Why are you condoning this violence? So get involved, talk to your kids, talk to your employees, talk to your employer um, and, and, and make a plan, uh, make a threat assessment plan and get involved so we can all be upstanders instead of bystanders. And then we'll be able to stop the killing. Well, Catherine Schweit, thank you for being involved on this program, and Mark Fullman, and also Dr. Peter Langman. Uh, we really appreciate the insights you brought to us today, and you've helped us better understand the complex issues of mass and school shooters and what each of us can do to prevent another shooting. To our viewers, thank you for joining us. As always, we bring you different perspectives on things that matter with people who care.